And now we'll hear from Clint Phillips of Medici. Clint, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. It's very exciting to talk about our passion and the world that we're involved in day and night uh, being telemedicine. We uh, started pounding the pavements and building this tool called Medici, which is Latin for doctor, as a remarkable virtual care platform. But for years, we've been telling doctors, hey, doc, do you realize that soon you will be doing more virtual visits a day than in-person visits? And uh, we had no credibility. Doctor said, never. Patients have to come into the office. I have to see them. I have to touch them. I have to you know, be in the same room with them. And we said, Doc, that's just not what we are seeing in the data and where we're seeing technology go. Patients are not always going to be able to come into the office and you're going to move towards a virtual environment. Um, the doctors didn't believe it and they felt like it would always just be a small fraction of the care that they gave. And the data that we looked at said 2024 is the year where doctors do more visits virtually than in person. Well, COVID entered the scene and moved that four years soon. In 2020, we saw doctors starting to do more virtual visits than in-person visits. Some of them, 100% of their visits became virtual, not just the majority. So it was a very um, uh, a good validation for what we had been talking about, but it also was um, you know, a massive upheaval for providers who are now scrambling to be able to think, what are we gonna to do to be able to address patients who are scared to come in, don't wanna come in, staff in our office who don't wanna come in. What are we gonna do about this? This is a, just the biggest change that has ever happened to healthcare professionals in the shortest amount of time imaginable. So uh, we live in this day and night, we've got about 20,000 doctors who use our platform in different ways to collaborate with their team, to be able to collaborate and treat their patients. And we wanted to give you a little more of a glimpse of the future. Right now, telemedicine for most people is a Zoom call, is a FaceTime, is this video. But that is not really the full potential of what telemedicine can deliver. There's so much more, and our goal at Medici is to be able to take the stress out of medicine. And in taking the stress out, we know that a patient who is at their home a doctor who is maybe at their home or not overrun by administrative tasks and people in the waiting room probably is going to have less stress. And how can we match the ease and the convenience that telemedicine provides, but also ensure clinical excellence? So we started to say, could we make telemedicine even safer, um, even a higher quality care than in person? And the first doctor said, never. You know, you're never going to be as well off and as a person coming into the office. But we've started to show that for various reasons, we are seeing that telemedicine or virtual healthcare can be even better clinically um, and effective wise over uh, a person coming in the office. A first little example here I'll give you is this you can see is an AI that we're working with in telemedicine. Instead of a doctor having to ask, or a nurse, or anybody saying, when did this start? Tell me about your primary complaint. You know, describe the pain for me. Uh, describe these symptoms. And instead of just giving people this clipboard that nobody even looks at or takes you know, note of, let's give them something that actually adjusts depending on the question they have. And what's amazing, at the end of seven to 10 questions that a patient can do virtually, it tells the doctor the likely differential diagnosis. And sometimes there's something in there that the doc might not have thought of, but it's instantaneous for the patient. It's not frustrating like a clipboard. It's automatically saved and becoming part of that person's healthcare record. It's groundbreaking. And a doctor now, we talk about clinical impact where the doctor can say, oh, well, that is exactly what I would have thought. I don't have to ask those questions. The clinical summary is amazing. And often we see a doctor in 30 seconds has better context around this patient than the time that it took for the clipboard and the nurse and the conversation um, around it. So just think as that expands in the effectiveness and the support that that can give providers to be able to make decisions confidently, to be able to know that the right questions have been asked, for example. In the next slide, I'll give you just another little glimpse of remote patient monitoring. Um, there are some incredible remote patient monitoring devices, whether you are tracking 
blood pressure or glucose or air quality or all sorts of things that may be impacting the health of a patient. Here's an example of a little device that we use called um, Steffi. And Steffi, you can put it on your chest or uh, back and somewhere near your heart and it will record the breathing sounds, it will record the heart sounds. The doctor can then replay that slowly, they can use different filters, they can look at all the last times you came. Imagine a doctor today with a stethoscope going, this sounds different to when you came in a year ago. The doctor could never remember that um, or be expected to, but now a doctor has a record weekly if they want. All I have to do is put it over my heart, push a button for 15 seconds, it becomes part of my medical record. In addition, as AI gets more advanced, it will help the clinician or the provider be able to identify, hey, there's a red flag here. This needs an additional layer of um, care or tests or pieces like that. So not only can we make this person comfortable at home, not only can we make sure that we're asking the right questions and not frustrating people with unnecessary intake, but we can also provide remote patient monitoring in the future that will give the physician a level of comfort uh, that is just at another whole level as how effective they can be clinically. And instead of a provider running around on administrative tasks, here cases can be recorded and be prepared in a way that a provider can focus on relationship. A provider can focus on taking care of the person versus running around trying to establish and store and find clinical data on the patient. So there's just two great examples. We've got about 10 different areas in where we're making telemedicine in the future, so much more than a doctor just sitting across from a patient asking questions that we can really be treating and monitoring with a level of excellence that we just never were able to before. So um, thank you to Modern Healthcare for just uh, the opportunity to talk and give you a glimpse of the uh, future of telemedicine and virtual healthcare. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Clint, for that. You know, many medical groups and solo practices have had to rapidly scale up telehealth, and in many cases, in a matter of days. Uh, you know, what best practices can you share for smaller organizations that might be concerned that virtual care might require significant capital or technology resources that some smaller groups just don't have? Adam, that's a great question. The uh, the challenge for providers has been unprecedented. They've got um, cost capital concerns, they've got workflow changes, they've got patient mix changes, and you know their world has been turned upside down. I compare um, choosing a telemedicine provider or support, like when you choose a restaurant, a lot of providers jumped onto the first tool they found, and they went into that tool, and right now they're going, this isn't what I was really expecting, and I need something else. And many providers have had a really bad experience and they're going, this, this is not sustainable. I did it while I had to and already they're starting to force patients to come back into the office. But what they're finding is that patients are saying, you know what, I, I really need to do things virtually. I'm doing everything else in my life virtually. Doctor, surely you can take care of me in that way. So providers, a lot of them have had the bad experience of going into the wrong restaurant and if you judged all restaurants on one bad experience, you, uh, you're never going to go to a restaurant. But we know that the variance in restaurants are massive. One star to seven star. And so what we find ourselves here is helping providers understand that just because you did telemedicine doesn't mean you did it as well as you could have. This doesn't mean that you set it up easily and for your patients and that it is supportive. Some jumped on you know, Skype and they're realizing, man, this you know, Zoom thing doesn't really help me anymore so I'm just going to go back to what I know and that's a big mistake so we really encourage providers to be able to say let me look at the platform you know let me make sure that I've demoed and tried and kicked the tires and we're seeing patients now that have jumped onto a cheaper platform or jumped onto a free platform and going this isn't sustainable and they're either going back fortunately there are some that are saying well maybe I do need to kick the tires a little harder and platforms like Medici have a lot more robust opportunity and people, we have customer support that help identify what do you really need? And everybody's mix is a little different. What a behavioral health provider needs is very different from an orthopedic provider or a nurse 
um, or a OBGYN. So being able to understand the provider is very important and we think we've built something that takes the care of you know the great majority of providers. Excellent. So Clint, as we help people make that transition, how are we? How do we ensure that they're still tr- able to track revenue, quality performance in this virtual environment, especially when some folks are taking these calls from their home? Adam, I come back to the uh, the same piece. Your platform matters. Um, some of these platforms don't have any regard for your billing, you know, and now it's left on you to be able to figure out and process it through your office. Wouldn't it be great if you could just push a button right there and say, bill now, Um, you know, just something that we've been able to bill. Is your um, platform taking record of every consult? Do we know who you visited with, when you visited them, uh, you know, what insurance they had, what the complaints was, uh, complaints were. So being able to understand that some platforms have this, some platforms don't, especially as you're realizing the value of being able to work from home, being near your kids. Maybe your kids are doing virtual school, um, being near for them needs a platform that has the flexibility to make sure that this isn't just a video platform. Video is easy. It's a workflow that's really difficult. It's billing that's really difficult. You know, it's compliance that's really difficult. And often providers didn't choose their platform on some of those pieces as well. Excellent. Excellent. Clint, if I could just ask one more question. You know, virtual care has the potential to drastically expand the patient base. Geographic barriers don't mean anything anymore when, you know, when you move to telehealth for a physician practice so, or a health system. So do you have any best practices on how um, leaders can overcome language barriers as they expand their patient population? One of the important things for good health care means that you need to remove barriers. And there's so many barriers to health care. If you've you're a patient, everybody's a patient, they've realized these barriers are crazy. I just want to ask a doctor a question and I have to jump through all these hoops and uncertainty of what it's going to do and cost. As we think about removing the geography as a barrier, now a doctor can treat that person that maybe moved two hours away and we've removed the the geographic boundaries in many ways. It opens up all sorts of new opportunities for providers. Another thing is, what if we could remove language barriers? And Medici has actually built now 30 languages, so I love the question, in that a provider can get a question in their language from a person with Spanish or Chinese or Farsi um, and read it in English. The physician writes it back in English or whatever their home language is, and the patient reads it in their language. We do this in South Africa now with Zulu and Sutu, Imagine, you know, when a provider who only speaks English can now help all sorts of people um, that have needs, all sorts of underserved, you know, communities. And language is not a barrier. Geography is not a barrier. All of a sudden, providing true health and care becomes a reality as to the restrictions that we've known up until today. Excellent. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Adam.